had this, this, this movie for 14 years. So ever since I was in film school, I, I wanted to make it. And when I got out, I pitched it to every studio, and everybody told me the same thing. Uh, you're just some dumb kid at school, and no one's interested in the subject matter, and there's no audience for Hispanic movies. And so it took a long time. Family uh, goes with me, they kind of integrate themselves to that life. But I said, do I want to do this? And when I met Jorge, I knew there was something that we could do beautifully together, but that more important than anything, to protect the movie. And one of the reasons I was interested is because the things that make the movie great now are the things I knew were going to get us a lot of no on the studios. And I'm interested, for me, lost causes are the only ones that are worth fighting for. The other stuff is not worth fighting for. So the day he came to pitch. Uh, so the day I came to pitch, I went to his house and, you know, it, it was meeting one of my heroes and it was a disaster. It will go down as one of the worst <laughs> pitches of all time. He was um, sweating all the time. I, I, mean, well, I was sweating. It was like 100, 110 degrees in LA. It was, we made the horrible decision to pitch outside and it was next to the pool area. So I almost fell in like three times. And then when I started pitching, we had artwork and maquettes uh, and, and it was so, it was so much pressure. And then uh, as soon as my mouth opened, uh, my people betrayed me in the house next door. And there was like 10 lawnmower guys. And I said, oh. ah, so I had to yell the pitch to him. So it was a mess. And so at the end of the pitch, I was just ready to shake his hand and, and get out of there and say I got to meet him. Uh, and he said, oh yeah, that was a terrible pitch. <laughs> Uh, but he saw, you saw through my crappiness. And, and, and I was a big fan of him from Antigua, his animated cartoon. My daughters and I watched it together. And what was evident it was this movie was his soul. He was not doing this to make money. He was not doing this to buy a Corvette, to have a house in Malibu. He was not doing it for a career. He was doing it to breathe. You know, it was his life that was in danger. And actually, those are the movies I try to produce, movies that mean that much to the very uh, Well, ever since I've started making cartoons, they've always been a love letter to my culture and my country. I, I grew up not watching myself on the screen, so that's been my mission, to always, you know, I have a son now, so I wanted to see our, our, our culture and our history up on the screen like something normal. So from the beginning, I've always wanted to do this stuff. And the, the, the mission of the movie, visually, was always to sort of represent that moment when I was a kid when I would walk into uh, a bakery shop and all the cakes were there, or I would walk into a toy store, a or, candy store. or a candy store, that visceral joy of, I love all this, and I want all this, and, and, and so that's where the movie comes from. And we are, the, we are both cake whisperers. <laughs> <laughs> the cakes talk to us. <laughs> yeah, <it's amazing. laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, the folk art is full of uh, wooden marionettes and wooden characters, and some of my favorite ones were, you know, the, the rich kids had the, the Batman made out of plastic, uh, the middle class kids had the bootleg Batman, and then the really poor kids had the wooden version of Batman. <laughs> so I like the wooden ones a lot, and, and they would age with me and they would get dirty, and I, and I, so this movie, I also love Pinocchio, so I wanted to see a movie with all folk art characters, and I'm telling you guys, right now everybody loves it, but at the beginning, the studios were like, are you crazy? The, the things that made it great is what made them hard to, to do, and, and we kept getting no, 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 but I kept telling Jorge, look, we're getting no for the right reasons, which means we are preserving what makes the movie special. If there's something worse than not making a movie is doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And then you end up putting three, four, five years of your life, and you come up with a thing that you're not proud of. You know, and, and uh, we felt we needed to protect the spirit of it. We could make this concession, that concession, tweak it here, tweak it there, but not touch the heart of the movie. And, and uh, the moment, we, we got very close here and there, but the moment we, uh, with real effects, when we stepped into, into a meeting with Fox, you know, and Jim Janopoulos is a Greek, which means Mexican in, uh, in another <laughs> language. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like we, we connected at a visceral level he understood the emotion of it. He understood the, the, the fact that I think in a world that is, and you've heard me say this before about my movies, in a world that is cynical and ironic, the new punk is emotion. You know, to be able to embrace emotion and vulnerability. We're talking about feminism, but I also there is a huge need for men to be able to be emotional. And for us not to feel bad about recognizing that we are all flawed. 
you know, we, we get into a discourse where everybody tries to prove him or herself right and superior. I love flaws, and that was what I, we talked about it conceptually. The puppets are all uh, chipped, the painting is worn, Isn't, they are not perfect. Nobody in the movie is perfect, but nobody in the movie is a villain. If you see it that way, it's such a humanistic film that Shivaba has a different agenda, but it's a, an adorable rascal, you know? Uh, Joaquin and Manolo are our gods, but they are both lovable, and so on and so forth. Uh, for me, it was very important that I had gone to other studios and there were these legacies. They would tell me, well, we did all these films and the way we do them is this way, so you're going to have to fit into that box. Real Effects was a new studio and they said, we, we'll take a chance on you if you take a chance on us. So I feel like I got to go there from the ground up. And I think Guillermo uh, also sort of told me, this is a place that will support you. And they, they, put, they put everything on us and they really, really supported us. And then 20th Century Fox uh, saw what we were doing and obviously they wanted to work with Guillermo. And so Jim jumped in and that's, this movie's a collaboration, but these studios have been so brave to take on this movie that a lot of places thought, this is just too different or too weird. Uh, it, and, and, and they put they put their heart and soul into it too. So I could not be more thankful. And I, I think I speak to, to you for you too that we we could not have done this with all this studio support. Well, you know, what what is curious is you get you hear all the time bring us something different, bring us something fresh, and it's like you brought a dead rat. It's like the reaction is terrified, and this was so fresh and new. We you know the usual stuff. On animated movies, they, they all they all end up looking the same. You know, they, they they homogenize their look and their content, and some of the emotion feels prefabricated. And I, I knew we were coming from a completely genuine place uh, to embrace a culture that, the way I see film, I think film is like going out to dinner. And I feel it's a banquet, and you don't want to have the same food you have at home. You want to go and eat a fantastic Chinese meal or uh, Italian or Greek. And we said, let's lay up an amazing Mexican buffet of audiovisual experience and have people go, I've never tried this before, it's really great. You know, I didn't know I would like it, but if I try it, I know I would. And the partnership with the studio is only when the studio stops looking back and the studio looks forward is when they become artists. Because the, the tragedy is artists are always looking ahead saying, let's go there. And most of the time, students are looking back saying, but nobody has gotten there. They got it there, back there, and, and it's, a, it's a struggle. This movie, was, it's a miracle we got it made. It took us a lot, a lot of time and a lot of notes. Absolutely. Uh, well, I was very lucky. Uh, Sandra designs all the female characters. She's a family winning designer. And, and I design all the male characters. And so because I was the director, I got to uh, tell the whole studio, this is exactly what the characters will look like. And every department in the beginning complained and said, well, they're going to be really hard to animate, they're going to be really hard to light, they're going to re be really hard to texture and model. And every time I said, trust me, please, please, I beg you, I know it's going to be really hard, but in the end, I think it's going to be really unique. And then I go home and cry myself to sleep, going, it oh, works, it oh, works. And eventually, when we started seeing shots and the characters started to emote and the sequences started to come alive, all those, the whole team said, okay, we get it. And, and it took a long time. And even with the studio, I mean, we did a ton of tests to convince them these characters could emote. Because in the beginning, the fear was they're so stylized. They're wooden. And they're Literally. wooden, and they're so different. I mean, I was the only guy in the beginning who was going, yeah, it's going to work. But secretly, I was like, I, I hope it works. <laughs> but then eventually, with time, I think, I think all those tests paid off. And, and it got to the point where we did a sequence, and we showed it. And we said, okay, if these characters can make people laugh and they can make people cry, we can take, tell us a whole story. But, but the whole the whole design process was a negotiation. You needed to see the the how much of the 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 depth of the eye what you wanted to make. Do you want to make human looking eyes, or do you want to make them feel painted with the the pie slice of uh, flesh animation painted on the eye, or do you want depth? And to graduate all that, that look is a lot. And it's, you know, I jokingly say it's not eye candy, it's eye protein, but it is. Because at the end of the day, the way they look is part of the story. And for example, just to give you guys a nerdy detail, uh, so the, the male characters in the film have a pupil, but they have a triangle missing from the pupil. 
and the female characters have a whole round pupil. And so the idea in the film is that the male characters are missing something, mm -hmm. and they're trying to find themselves, and the female characters are complete. And, and at the same time, it's an homage to Popeye and Betty Boop. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to fight. You, you have all those discussions, and they're creative, but they also, you have to prove them. Each of those has proved concept. In the beginning, uh, you know, we were going back and forth, and, and in the script, I had kind of been flirting with the Orpheus myth. And I remember at a meeting with Jim Canopolis and, and, and Guillermo, uh, where we kind of said, let's just embrace Orpheus and let's embrace the musical side of Orpheus. And, and so I went back and started working on the script, and I'm not a songwriter, so I just started writing in the playlist of my life. All the songs I love and my grandparents love and my parents love, you know, Elvis and, and Miss Marquis, and all these songs I put in the script thinking, well, at some point a lawyer is going to tell me you can't use any of this stuff. Uh, and so, and Guillermo said, you're not going to be a creep. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> Greek, Greek has always been the holy grail, and it's, it's never been gettable. I tried on Hellboy, we tried again later, and, and they've always said it's too personal to us, and, but they accepted on this. But the beauty, the beauty of this is we, uh, I was working on a, on a musical version of Pan's Labyrinth with uh, Gustavo Santolaya and Paul Williams, and I said to Jorge, what do you think about them writing the original songs and Gustavo producing the the score that is a mixture of two original songs and the rest, basically let's try to do the most bitching Mexican covers of this piece. And, and that's Mexico, right? In a, in a way, we take music, we take influences from the whole world and we make them our own. Norteño music in Mexico comes from the polka, from Germany. Germany yes. And so all these influences, right? Mexico is a mix of, of Spain and the, and the aspects and the Mayans coming together. So. It, it became very organic to me. I grew up in the border uh, in Tijuana, between the U.S. and Mexico. So I grew up with one ear listening to the U.S. music and one ear listening to Mexican music. And that's what informed me who I am. Uh, and, and Creep, for example, is a song that spoke to me, and I think it speaks to every teenager who felt they didn't belong. And so in the moment in the film, when uh, Manolo starts singing it, you know, it didn't matter what era that song came from. Manolo made it. It's eternal. Yeah, it's eternal. Made it, made it his own. And so each of the bands, one by one, kind of got our movie and, and they gave us the, the permission uh, to use these songs and, and to make them be part of the Book of Life world. And Gustavo gave it a spin. Uh, you know, you, we have a Rod Stewart song, an Elvis song. I mean, it's pretty crazy. You know? the, the first time Gustavo, Gustavo is such a serious composer. A lot of people in America don't know that he was a, a massively successful pop songwriter in Argentina. And, uh, Everybody was a little afraid, is he the right guy? Because, you know, they know them from the very dark and dramatic scores of Alejandro Gonzalez in Yahoo, too. Or, and the first proof of concept of that was, do you think I'm sexy with my ass? You know, it was so funny. Immediately we went in. The other thing that was organic is knowing, making his dilemma be a singer that doesn't want to kill as a bull fighter, it allowed for his feelings to come through the singing and the guitar in an organic way without feeling like it was imposed uh, in the structure of the film. And finally, becoming a man because he's capable of the most heroic thing, which is apologize. And apologize with who he is. So it, it all was organic in the process. We were writing the, 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 the movie, writing the songs, what was an inventory became the Ten Commandments, you yeah. know? and it was all organic in the process. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the, the cast is incredibly eclectic, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, a lot of them, because I, you know, uh, I have a co-writer, but I, I was also, the, also uh, the writer, in the records I would always tell the, the, the actors, let's, let's do it the way it was written, but now that you know what the moment's about, the scene's about, it's improv. And so I would, I would try stuff, and they were hilarious. For example, Channing came up with Joaquin yelling Joaquin all the time. Uh, all these things that happened organically. But for example, Placido Domingo, we, I didn't think we could get him, honestly. And so when, uh, when, when we talked to him, he, he sort of saw his part. And I, I got a phone call from Placido Domingo at 2 o'clock in the morning. Pretty <laughs> surreal. Pretty surreal. So I picked up the phone, and it was like the voice of God, right? <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> and, and he said, uh, this, this part, I don't want a bigger part, but I want a more meaningful part. And for Mr. Lomito to say it to me, I basically stayed up all night rewriting his, his part. And in the morning, I called them and I pitched them. 
okay, you're an ancestor who always wanted to sing opera, mm -hmm. and you couldn't do it because you couldn't go against your father. And so Manoro's going to go down and liberate you, and you're going to get to sing. And there was like a 10 second silence on the phone. And I thought, oh no, he hates it. <laughs> and he said, that's beautiful, I'll do it. And that was it. But what is great is when he sings Cialito Lindo, it's such a release. You feel like the character comes to life from you. Yeah. I love I mean, I was, I was with El Madrid and I had such a blast. You know, he brought the food to the studio. We, you know, we ate like the degenerates. And but I found so much fun and personality in his voice. And in cartoons, you want the voice to, to define the character as much as the look. For example, Channing Tatum, we wanted uh, Joaquin to be the quarterback. The quarter of that is effortlessly charming, and the mandrilla just brought so much humor to the part. I mean, when I met him, I fell in love with him, and it was one of those things where he called me and he just said, "You have to hire him. You have to hire him. When you meet him, you're gonna fall in love with him." And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. You know, they, they both have never sung in a movie before. Uh, they're both in the Spielberg movie The Terminal. They have a love story in that movie, but they never talk. It's all from Tom Hanks. So I knew they had a ton of chemistry. This is uh, the sequel to the term. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we didn't know Diego could sing in, in the beginning, and it was one of those things where uh, Gustavo took him in, and it was like a doctor. It was like having a paternity test. We were both waiting and, and kind of nervous. Like, can you sing? Can you sing? And then I get the phone call from Diego. So he said, Jorge, I can sing. <laughs> and it was a big day in the production. And then, sure enough, you know, we were going to record the last song, the, the, and then Zoe, I'm telling you, no lessons, nothing. She just showed up, let, heard the song, she was like, okay, got it, and the, the Gustavo, everybody was sort of pulling their breath, and it just came out, and it's exact. I think take one is what's in the movie. Uh, everybody was blown away. It was kind of incredible. What is, what is great about it, it and I, I really, we talked about it with Gustavo, and he, he really felt that way too, that their voices are unadorned. They are not super processed, multi-layered, hyper-produced. Hyper -produced. We said it should be like a serenade. I mean, I, I serenaded my wife for many years. And what you do is you stand by the balcony, with the mariachi and you just go, here we go. <laughs> and, and Diego has that purity, that, that simplicity. And the movie is a marriage of high technology, sophisticated storytelling with an emotional directness and cleanness and simplicity mm -hmm. in a way that makes the fairy tale feel ancient and oral tradition. And the same, the singing needed to feel that way. So when he sings under her balcony, I love you too much. We wanted it to be the simplest thing ever. We didn't want the orchestra to, to start it. To, it was a guy saying, this is how I feel. Absolutely. Uh, I think anybody in the US who heard of the dead thought it was a zombie movie. <laughs> <laughs> in a shopping mall. Now, the, the thing that is important to know is Day of the Dead is about life. And and what what is Dead, Octavio Paz says it beautifully yeah. in his poem, that he had death by him on his shoulder saying, live. You know, and it's, I say it jokingly, but it's carpe diem, sees the day with mariachis. It's, it's, it's the, the guys that came before us telling us, you have to live. You have to live. We, and it's an emotional connection you have with people that came before you. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I used to go on the day of the dead with my grandmother, and we would clean the grave of my grandfather in the morning, make it all nice, then put the bread, put the drink, talk to him, she would pray, and then we would go to the market and buy a sugar skull, a candy skull, and a couple of skulls of every kind I could. And, and it made you connect with the stories. She would tell stories about him that she hadn't told me before, and you would spend the day talking about those that were not with you. So the secret about talking about death is that you're talking about life. And that was the message in the movie, which is a vital, incredibly vital and powerful one. Well, uh, The Princess Bride is one of my all-time favorite movies. <laughs> and there's even, you know, one of the lines in the movie is, as you wish, Mrs. Sanchez. So it, it was definitely a big, uh, a big idea to sort of, a way to bring the whole world into the story. It's such a magical world that 
Uh, in the beginning, there was a little bit of a fear that it's just too magical from the start. We need to ease the audience into this magic land. So that's that's why the kids in that group, they're from all over the world. Uh, you know, th This idea is we're telling the story not to, just to an audience in America, we're telling the movie to everybody in the world. Including Scandinavia. <laughs> no, but, 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 but what was important was to make it, make it about a beginning and an end of a story that feels ancient, you need a narrator. You need to root it with the tree of life, the book of life, mm -hmm. the power of Mexico. And then, one of my favorite mo moments in the movie has always been, what's it with you Mexicans and death? You know, which is a, a question that an audience member could have anywhere, in China, in Italy, anywhere. But, but the power of it is not only that, is to bring it full circle in the way that Princess Bride comes full circle, and it now is much more meaningful. When, when she says, everybody dies, but these kids will have the courage to live. It's beautiful, and it, it's, it's the essence of the movie. We're telling that story to those kids all over the world. I, I pitch it to him for Shivalba because he is, the, Ron, for those of us that know him, he is the ultimate rascal. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he brings such suave, funny uh, personality to a character. And I thought, I said, Jorge, Try it. Just like they say, you, you know, when we were talking about casting, I was pitching Hector in the Sonda, for example, and I was pitching this and that, and I said, Jorge, try Ron. If you don't like Ron, and he doesn't deliver the humor, and he tried it and fell in love. And, and for me, it was a little bit of pressure, because Ron has done such, such amazing stuff with Guillermo. I, I, I was like, well, there's a, you know, this is like, this is a lot of pressure. This is like cinematic history. This is a, a cinematic marriage. It's a threesome with two fat guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous situation. <laughs> uh, ask you, it's me. I, I, I'm a big hip hop fan, as you guys saw in the movie. There's a Bismarck Key song, there's hip hop beats to the Ennio Marconi bullfight. And this movie's about music, so how could I not include my love of hip hop? And so when we started casting the gods, I said, well, I want a goddess of Mexican soap operas, Cato Castillo, to play La Muerte. I want a god of cinema, that's Ron Perlman, to play Zibarba. And then I want a god of hip hop to play, <laughs> to play uh, the camera maker. And, and, and when we first... Uh, but he doesn't it, sing. And he doesn't sing. And the first time we, we, we met, I pitched him the movie, he gave me this look of like, are you sure I'm the right guy? <laughs> and I kind of explained it to him, and I said, you know, if you, if you want something to feel even more Mexican, you put someone not Mexican next to them. And all this contrast will bring uh, the flavors out even more. And so I, from the beginning, we talked about the cast. It can't just be all Hispanic actors, because we don't want to scare everyone else into thinking this movie's just for a Hispanic audience. We want it to be for everybody. And so these larger-than-life personalities, the cast had to be from all over the world. We, we had a lot of songs yeah. offered to us for the ending, and it took and this is not a figure of speech. About three seconds of hearing the song, that we all said, "This is it. This is the the perfect spirit." And it, it was like it was sent out in an email, and we both replied like ten seconds apart, like that one. That's it. And uh, this idea that there's music in the film from these very established bands and songs that have been around forever, and then there's original songs, and then to me, the us to do a song is the bridge between those. This is the future. This is a and this is a husband and wife band that is so earnest. I mean, they played this song at their own wedding for the first time ever. And you see the video, you guys look it up on, on, on YouTube. It's really emotional. And it could not be more earnest. Yes. I mean, that, that one, imagine telling a band from England, we want to do a ranchero version of our Grammy winning song. Churros is more. Yeah, I, I, just so you guys know, my, I'm obsessed with churros yes. in, in all my work, and, and I'm guilty to admit this, but my favorite churros are in Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have been to this hotel, you know. Oh, yeah. I've been told.